Um, Malala, <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much. Um, this Q&A session is being watched mainly by adults who are willing to develop their professional, social, emotional and technological competences as well as become better human beings. Mm -hmm. And as someone who has transcended the importance of education and formation to another level, you really are somebody who we hugely admire. So thank you so much for being here to answer our questions today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. I think a great place to begin would be the beginning. So can you tell us a bit about your life history and when you realised the importance of education? So uh, I have mentioned my story many times. I was uh, growing up in the north of Pakistan in this beautiful valley called Swat Valley. It was a spot of tourism. Uh, but I was only 10 years old when everything changed for me because this group called the Taliban uh, started coming to our valley and they started imposing their so-called Islamic laws, which were completely patriarchal and against women. They banned women from going to markets. They bombed more than 400 schools and they banned girls' education. So if you were a girl, you were not allowed to go to school. And that was the time when I realized that education was more than just reading and writing for women and girls. It was about their empowerment. It was about their emancipation. And the Taliban were against women's rights and equality. And they knew that in order to stop women from having opportunities and, and from having sort of those, uh, those, um, those ways of empowerment, the best way was to prevent them from accessing school. So they, they had figured it out, uh, and that's when I realized that I needed to speak out. My father was already an education campaigner. He was joining protests. He was speaking out to media, and I would walk with him as an 11-year-old girl, and I would participate in the protests. I would speak to media. I also volunteered to appear in New York Times documentaries. I also did a blog for BBC, and I was sharing my diary. So this is what activism was at that time. You know, it felt like we were we were just you know speaking to these cameras and these people, and and it we just did not realize what the impact of that was going to be. Um, and at that time, you feel like it's just one small step. Like, what is this going to do to bring change? But with time, you realize that you can build a lot of pressure. Civil society can join you. You can put pressure on the government, on other key leaders to listen to your voices. And at least people realize that. That, that nobody is silent, that there are people who are concerned about the situation there. They want peace, they want women's rights to be protected. So that is my story in short. And uh, since then, I've been campaigning for girls' education. Uh, and you know everybody knows that then I was attacked at age 15 uh, and I was brought uh, for treatment to the UK. She is the Pakistani schoolgirl who took on the Taliban. If they are saying that we are Islamic people and we are Muslim and uh, we want uh, Sharia law, so first of all, I will, I, I will, I will show them Quran. What Quran says? Quran didn't say that girls are not allowed to go to school. The daughter of a Swat Valley school principal, Malala Yousafzai, had become a high-profile campaigner for girls' education. For that, on October the 9th, 2012, she was targeted by the Taliban shot in the head on her way home from school with friends. When we saw the gun, we started screaming, Kainat says. He asked, who's Malala? I don't think anyone told him, but he recognized Malala and started shooting. The 14-year-old activist was evacuated to the United Kingdom, and as she battled to survive her injuries, the attempt on her life was widely condemned. Rallies and vigils were held around the world. Malala is near and dear and people joined her in speaking out. She's the role model for every, 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 girl, every girl in this world. She was uh, very confident, she was a very brave girl, and uh, we all pray for her. And I think uh, we as a nation uh, are very proud of her. Malala had become a global icon, and to honor her cause, the United Nations declared November the 10th Malala Day. I am adding my voice to the messages from over one million people across the globe. Education is a fundamental human right. It is a pathway to development, tolerance, and global citizenship. A right that Malala continued to exercise, even from her hospital bed. She told me on phone uh, that, uh, uh, please bring me my books of class nine, and I will attempt my examination in SWAT, uh, board examination. 
The schoolgirl still faces many months of recovery in the UK, but her voice has been heard and continues to echo. I want to uh, spend my life serving people. I will be a social activist till my death, and I want to be a politician in future. Uh, but since then, I realized that you know, I'm in a place where I cannot uh, just fight for myself and girls in Swat Valley, but I can fight for girls all around the world. So I started Malala Fund, and I'm campaigning for all those 130 million girls who are out of school to be in school and have access to safe quality and free education. And you have recently graduated from Oxford University. Congratulations. Tell us about your academic experience at the university and how that impacted on your life and how it's transformed you as a person. So while I, I am campaigning and fighting for girls' right to education, I was also receiving my education, which I just completed last year uh, in the time of uh, a pandemic. <laughs> uh, and I'm the first year of uh, 2020 COVID, you know, the COVID graduates. Uh, so I received that title as well. <laughs> uh, it was, you know, it was such a great experience to be in university. And it was uh, for the first time that I was uh, living on my own without my family, just as everybody else. I was really excited trying to explore, uh, you know, making friends and, and just enjoying uh, a social life. Um, and they say that, you know, when you are studying, in Oxford, you 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 know you, you have to decide between having a social life, studying, or sleep. Uh, you can't have all three. You have to pick two. And I was like, I I couldn't even have one of these. Like you know, so I just picked the social life. I was not having enough sleep or studies, uh, but it was important. You know, when you realize that you don't just learn from like lectures and books, but you also learn from the people around you, from your professors to your friends. And I just learned so much in those three years. Uh, it was uh, sort of a, a difficult ending because we were graduating in COVID times and I had to take my exams at home and I graduated at home, but this was the case for you know, hundreds and thousands of students. Uh, and, uh, but I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to study there and I, um, and I was studying in, in this beautiful college called Lady Margaret Hall. And it was the first women's college in Oxford and it was started in the late 1800s and before that like there was no college for women and it just shocks you that it was just like a hundred or so years ago that women were not allowed to be in college and then even when they were in college they were they were getting the they were getting the, the education but their degrees were not acknowledged they were not given the degrees they were not able to sort of you know claim that they have been graduated and it was like much much later that they were able to study normally you know just the simple right of studying and graduating which we take for granted now like that was not the case for women just just 100 years ago so it's really important to then appreciate the struggle of women uh, you know, a few decades and, and, and centuries ago, uh, you know, that they have fought for us. Now that we are in this, in this place, we can study. They have done incredible work for us to be in this place. And when you're choosing a uh, major, it's a complex decision, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you're choosing what subject to study, um, if you have the opportunity to do so. Can you talk me through the process of how you decided to study philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford? So I think in the US uh, and in other countries, you can do like minors and then you can do majors and some universities are very flexible with allowing you to, 
explore multiple topics and, and courses. In the UK, you have to pick your degree, so you can't study everything else. So uh, I wanted to do PPE, which is philosophy, politics, and economics, uh, because that's like one of those classic degrees that Oxford offers. And, uh, and I really like the subject as well. I, you know, I, I enjoy philosophy. I was already interested in it. I love studying economics, especially macroeconomics, learning about unemployment, inflation, and how, you know, how do we keep the economy going? And uh, politics, yeah, of course, you know, it's another uh, interesting topic. So uh, these were like my, sort of my favorite topics. And then I was not, I loved science, but I just could not imagine myself, you know, studying science at university level. So yeah, this was the degree that I picked and I graduated with that. Congratulations. Thank and it's, you so it's much. It's the icing on the cake of already a lifetime of achievement. You've achieved so Thank much you. at such a young age. You got your Nobel Peace Prize at 17. Um, how do you cope with the pressure, both what society puts on you, but also the inward pressure that mm -hmm. you must put on yourself? Mm -hmm. There is pressure from society and it could be uh, pressure on you for some good things, you know, that you feel like you should uh, act in a good way, you should uh, do good stuff, but also it, it could be a negative influence as well. You could be asking too much from yourself, you could be a bit more sensitive to what you see on social media. My approach is that don't, you know, uh, my approach is that you should take care of yourself and uh, follow what your gut instincts tell you. Uh, so, but I do have that that internal pressure, the pressure that you have within you, uh, because you have you have made a commitment to yourself that you want to uh, play your role in creating a world where all girls can have access to education. And I always think about the moment when I did not have that opportunity to be in school, and at that time, like I wanted the world to speak for me, right? You question the world, like why is nobody speaking? Does does anyone? not care about the fact that girls can't have access to school. And that's when you realize that, you know, that, that when you are in a better position, when you have the privileges and when you have the opportunities where you can do something for others, like why not do that? Because there could be someone in exactly the same place as you were. So I, you know, I think about those hundreds and thousands of Malalas out there who, who need a voice. Uh, so there is that pressure, but You know, other than that, it's 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 important to take care of yourself. Uh, but yeah, there are times when when there's you know there's a lot of work to do. And I uh, and I was still a student while I was traveling and I was doing my advocacy meetings. I was meeting world leaders and uh, asking them to increase their finance for education. And I was making trips around the world, going to Nigeria mm -hmm. and Iraq. And then you know the next morning I would be there in my classroom, you know, studying something about, uh, you know, cells in biology or something in chemistry, uh, including on the day when I won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I was, you know, I was, I was literally in my chemistry lesson and, I, and we were learning about like, uh, you know, just atoms and these things. And uh, all of a sudden my school's deputy head teacher calls me and she says, you know, I need to talk to you. And she usually calls you when you are sort of in trouble, you know, you have, you, you know, you have been a bad student, so I was a bit worried. I was like, what have I done? And when she said that, you know, Lala, you have won the Nobel Peace Prize, I don't know, I was in a complete shock, uh, like what has happened. But as soon as, you know, they called the school assembly and I gave, a, you know, I said a few words and told them how important education is, soon after that, you know, I went back to my class. I was like, I'm not gonna leave school right now. I'm not gonna go for any press conference or anything because the award is for education, right? So I need to complete my education for the day. And when I finish school, then I can go and, you know, handle media and give a statement and whatever I'm supposed to do. So I finished my, my day and I went back to my physics class. So, so that's, uh, so it was important for me to be a student, to be a girl of my age and to, uh, you know, and, and to remember that, you know, I, I should be like a student, I should, you know, finish my school day. And, 
and yeah, and, and live the life that people my age are living. Mm. What are the main changes that access to education brings to a person's life? Education um, can actually transform an individual's life. Uh, and when it comes to a girl's life, the, the impact of education is enormous. Uh, especially if you're living in a patriarchal society uh, where you face misogyny, where opportunities are limited to you just because of your gender. Education provides you with, with the tools and with the means through which you can have access to opportunities which, which you otherwise may not get simply because you are a girl, simply because you are a woman. Uh, and in many places, uh, you know, education has become a means of protection for girls, to protect themselves from uh, early child marriages, to protect themselves from the pressure of society, expecting them to you know, to behave in a certain way, expecting them to get married early, expecting them to just listen to their families. So when you are educated, you are in a much better position to, uh, you know, to know about your rights, to know about uh, the fact that you can earn for yourself and that you can decide to marry later in your age and that it should be your decision and nobody else's decision. So, uh, you know, along with that, when you are educated, you can, it allows you to have the opportunity to, you know, be financially independent. Uh, in many places, uh, for a woman, firstly, she is dependent on her father's family, and then when she marries off, then she becomes dependent on her husband's family. And it sort of goes back and forth, but you are always told to be sort of dependent on somebody else. So education provides you with the, with the means through which you can become financially independent as well. But these are just like individual level advantages that education brings. Education also has benefits for the communities because you know when a woman is educated, she can look after herself but also her children so we can have a healthy society. Uh, if a woman is educated, she has a job and, and you know that allows her to then marry later and then you know have sort of uh, a more well-planned family and, and to have less kids which helps her, which helps her family and sort of which helps our our economy as well. We, you know, we can continue uh, in a more sustainable way for our for our future. Uh, and along with that, you know, when women are in in the workforce, that brings more jobs. That adds, you know, that brings more money into the economy. Uh, you know, we have done studies that shows that if you invest in the education of girls, it adds up to thirty trillion dollars to the world economy. So there are economic, there are social, there are political advantages. Uh, when you educate a girl. I mean, you, the Malala Fund's full force research in 2018 points out exactly that, not only social but economic gains when we talk about mm -hmm. gender equity in the labour market. Um, in your opinion, can, how can education help achieve greater equal rights at work and what impact does this have on society? So we already know that, uh, you know, if a woman already has limitations in society, she has to go through many more barriers than uh, you know, if if she were a man, right? If, if they, these are like two com completely different paths that these two individuals have, and just because your gender is different, you're going to have more struggle on your way. Uh, so education is something that allows women to be in a place where she can have access to so many opportunities which otherwise she would not get. Uh, so I always think about you know the life of a girl if she does not have access to education. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, like for many girls, when they're not educated, firstly, they may not even know that they have equal rights because society mm -hmm. has told them that they do not have equal rights, that just because of their physical appearance uh, or just because of, you know, some social norms that they are weaker, that they do not, they're not capable of making decisions for themselves, uh, that it is the man who has to decide what is good for her. So with education comes awareness, and I think that's the first step towards equality. Then with education also comes opportunities, and that you know that allows a woman to be in a place where she can be in a slightly better position to have access to the opportunities that, that she wants. Like we do know that education does not, 
you know, address all the issues. It's not that, you know, a woman receives a degree and then all of a sudden she's getting equal pay and she is, uh, she can have access to any job and she's not discriminated anymore. There are still barriers in society. There are still these, these you know, these uh, sort of conscious and unconscious biases that we have and we know that you know, structurally, currently, the society is patriarchal in many places. Our institutions are patriarchal many, in many places, in, in many companies. You know, whether it's individuals or some algorithm making decision, we know that it shows bias uh, sort of towards men and against women. So there are still things that need to be fixed. And in that, we need more deliberate actions. Uh, and we need to sort of deliberately change those things. But education is one of the key ways towards ensuring that you know, that women have, women are in a better position. Okay. And social inequalities mean that not everyone has access to the same types of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so not everyone can become a scientist or a teacher or go into a world-changing profession. Mm -hmm. um, what role does access to education have in balancing these opportunities in creating all of these world-changing jobs for women, for mm -hmm. girls? I think, uh, you know, firstly, it should be the choice of a woman and a girl, you know, what they want to do in their life. But we need to recognize the role that uh, that social norms and that uh, you know what we what we see around us play in 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 making us uh, decide what we want, right? For example, you know, when when I'm you know I'm a, I'm a girl in school and I see that uh, I'm told that you know it's only a girl is only supposed to be. A nurse, a teacher, a doctor, that's it. She cannot be a scientist. She cannot be the prime minister of a country uh, because those are like sort of so-called men's jobs or she cannot be in the army. She cannot be, you know, driving a tank or, uh, you know, how we have these uh, stereotypes. So I think, you know, it's challenging those social norms is, is important. And I think in that we need role models. We need examples of women so i think you know i personally really appreciate all all that women have done for us in the past who have become like the first um you know the first woman to go to space and the first woman to put her step on moon and the first woman to become a scientist the first woman to be the prime minister of a country and still we we still have those lists you know we still hear she's the first woman to become the ceo of a multinational company uh, and i think we need more and more uh, sort of role models like that so and we need to hear this more so it, it is no longer a news to us it's no longer you know a thing that okay it's the first woman to become a billionaire or something that that we normalize these uh, you know this world where there is equality and it's no longer a news um, but uh, along with that, you know, we also need to be um, looking at, you know, the role that entertainment and the, the news industry is, is playing around us uh, and the impact of that, you know, what we see around us sort of forms our concepts and our ideas. So it really has an impact on us. Sometimes we, some of us question it and we are like, oh, I see this, but it shouldn't be like this, so I'm going to change it. And for some of us, you know, it's often that we, you know, we don't realize and we sort of subconsciously accept society like that. Uh, so I think it's, you know, uh, for me personally, uh, you know, it's important that we break some of these rules and, uh, uh, and, and see and, and, you know, try to be more ambitious in creating a world where there is equality. Uh, and, uh, but I think role models, examples that play a key role and sharing your stories play a key role. So women need to hear more about women. Um, I was um, I was looking at coding, and I saw like how in many places, you know, and in many sort of uh, in many schools of coding, people are not often taught about the role of women in coding. And if you see like you know how um, you know when you look back at history, and you know that yes, women have been part of coding, and women have been part of the computer science, but their role was never recognized. It was never appreciated. So we also need to sort of look back at history and see how the stories have been told to us. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it, it's not that women didn't exist and they weren't taking any interest. Regardless, like, you know, despite the fact that they had these barriers, they still made it to that place and they played a key role in, in you know, in all industries, including, you know, coding and technology uh, and, and many others.